Hello, good afternoon everyone, thank you for coming. I'd like to get started. Um, so find a comfortable place, maybe a beverage and snack. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to settle in for a little time to hear about the incredible works of art that uh, our senior art architecture and design students have been um, hard at work uh, preparing. Please feel free to pass through. It is a hallway after all. Uh, my name is Mark Wonsenfar. I'm the curator of exhibitions and collections. And uh, it's my, my pleasure to congratulate the students on their hard work. Um, they've been participating in, a, in an ongoing organizational process with our museum staff, with the exhibition together. And as you can see uh, from the works on the walls, they've certainly risen to the challenge. Um, so it's my pleasure, without further ado, to introduce our first student, Erica Fisher, who has been working with uh, Professor Anna Chupa and Shimon Addy. Erica is an art and design major. Um, is that right? Art and, did I get right? <laughs> For one thing, is that right? Um, Erica's an art and design major. Uh, she's going to talk about the project. Use the microphone, or am I okay? I'm okay. 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 Awesome. Um, so I am from Comfort River, New Jersey. Um, I have a deeper love for the Jersey Shore. Um, a little bit about me: I love to travel, um, and most recently, I went to Whitefish National Park, which is where um, my my uh, project takes place. Um, I am also a first-generation college student. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to thank my mom um, for encouraging me to go to Lehigh and follow my dreams. Um, so I actually got interested in photography um, because I was a competitive figure skater for 13 years. Um, now how does that make any sense? Um, it's because um, my father was actually interested in photography and he would uh, bring his camera to the rig while I would skate um, every week, and then eventually he taught me how um, to, to shoot. Um, he taught me the difference between the basic things like shutter speed, um, f-stop, all that jazz. Um, and so, you know, he helped me practice, I would get a little bit better, and then I ended up being um, my club photographer for two different um, figure skating clubs in New Jersey. So that's kind of how I got into photography, but I didn't really um, pursue it until I got into college. Are you okay? Sorry. You're okay. Um, all the camera equipment I use today was my father's um, that he used to use. Unfortunately, I don't really um, have any contact with him anymore, but um, I've been resilient, or er, excuse me, I've been reluctant to um, upgrade any of my gear because it's very sentimental to me. Um, outside of academics, um, I'm a workaholic and, and a business traveler. Um, yeah, so in 2021, I decided to go on a road trip. Um, I went to 20 different states in 20 days. It was crazy, it was hectic, and one of the places I went to was White Sands. Um, and I just fell in love with it. It was a very cool place. Um, and I left with a very interesting impression of um, what these sand dunes meant to me. Um, these are some of my photos from that road trip. Um, I was in a hot air balloon for this one. Um, this is over Albuquerque. And the other one is um, at Yosemite. Uh, these are some of my works um, from the past last semester, uh, working with Anna. Um, all of my work is black and white photography. It's all digital. Um, so while I was um, taking photography with Anna, I discovered a lot for landscape photography. Um, I was researching Ansel Adams for a project I was working on, and I just fell in love with his work. Um, I knew everything that he was doing was on film, and I was working with digital photography, so it was quite different. Um, there was just something about the seriousness with black and white photography that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, so I knew I wanted to kind of try to achieve the same total range that he was able to do in his uh, film. 
uh, photos. Um, so I did some research and I found out that he came up with this technique called the zone system. And uh, the zone system um, is a way to kind of standardize uh, how your photo is going to be exposed. Um, there's 10 different zones as you can see up here. Um, this image kind of shows where each zone is in the photo. Um, it goes from black as black to white as white. Um, and zone 5 is where like, the middle gray area is. Um, so, I also found more of his photos of just, this is some sand, or, um, sorry, this is sand, snow. And I thought back to when I was in my tents on my road trip. And I was like, wow, this like kind of reminds me of what I saw when I was actually there. And then I saw this one of an actual sand dune. And I saw the texture and I saw the total range in the photo and I said, so I said, this is something that I really want to do. But, so since I'm working with digital photography, I want to know like how am I going to translate the zone system into my digital photography. Um, so, you know, when I was out um, in the you know, the sun is like super bright and it's clumping on the white of some sand. So, you know, it's really hard to make a photo exposing it correctly because of the extremely bright. So, uh, I also wanted to try to get something that would be in the back of and depending on which direction I was shooting in, some of the photos were more backlit than others. Um, so I didn't want any of my images to look cloudy or crazy at all. So exposing my images was really I was the focus of this project. I wanted to get as much total range as I could, um, and so to combat this exposure issue, um, I had to focus on metering my images. So in film, it's different than uh, the photography. You have like, an actual physical meter to figure out um, how you expose your images, um, but with the digital camera, it's built into the camera itself. Um, so there's different kinds of metering. Um, there's um, spot and partial metering, um, which lets you just pick a small area of the composition to focus on and emphasize how you want to expose. Um, there's separate metering, and it's straightforward. It's just in the center of uh, the composition, um, and it's just a, a little bit bigger percentage of um, the image. So what I used for mine, um, all of my images, was evaluated metering, um, and it divides the shot into different zones. Um, so I was able to determine like the best exposure for each of the areas in my composition. Um, and it's great for landscapes because there's like so much variation um, in each of the images. I'm not focusing on one with a small particular thing. Um, so, when the sand is like very, very dry, um, the just using the uh, layer might uh, actually underexpose the image. So, I also used um, exposure uh, uh, compensation to try to fix that. Um, so, I would bump up the exposure compensation to try to re expose the underexposed image. Um, so, these are some of my images compared to um, my inspiration images. Um, I was really focusing on trying to get, you know, the blackest whites I could and the whitest whites while also um, keeping the middle grays and a lot of um, detail in my images. Um, I just love the texture, and this one is actually my favorite one of uh, all my, my works in this series. 
Um, so this project was initially just something that I wanted to pursue uh, to develop my black and white photography skills, um, but it came, came out to be a little bit more than that. Um, something that I live by is something that my mom has always said to me, um, and that is everything in life is temporary. Um, the good, the bad, all of it is temporary. Um, to earn the highs, you have to experience the lows. Um, so my work is actually centered around the complicated feelings of grief. Um, there's really no right or wrong way to experience such a feeling. Um, each one of us will have vastly different experiences with the grieving process. Um, I might mention that grief isn't just limited to one sense of loss. Um, but it's also a very overwhelming sensation of despair, emptiness, um, and especially for me, uncertainty. Um, if I could describe it to you the way I feel it, it's just a sense of hollowness within me that I can't possibly fathom um, how I can really care for myself. Um, so, I don't imagine the person who you know, when you look at my energy, wow, that's great. Um, you might even go up to them and be like, oh, that looks like a nice picture. Um, oh, that looks really calm, which that's kind of the point. Um, so, this is so beautiful, yeah, at the same time. I just had these horrible, dreadful feelings. Uh, I'm just one person. There's no one around me for miles. You can't hear anyone. It was really nice to be there. The reason why I went back to my exams for this project uh, is because of the impression that I lost for the first time. Um, it's ethereal, it's, it's breathtaking, it's just beautiful to, to be there. Um, but on the other hand, it's extremely it's overwhelmingly quiet. Um, it's so vast in size. Um, to me, it was the opposite of peaceful. Um, it feels like the park is stretching on forever and ever, especially when you're down in the valleys of the dunes and you can't see anything around you. But then you climb up to one of the highest peaks in the park and you kind of see all the mountains around you. You almost feel trapped in a way. Um, so, I guess I'm trying to say that it's unsettling how it feels to be there. Um, because you're so free. Um, you can say anything and no one will hear you. Um, you can go in any direction as you choose. Um, there's no correct path. Um, and no one is there to guide you or to stop you. Um, it really is terrifying how long um, you can be in such a beautiful place. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming um, and listening to my presentation. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Anna Shuka, um, who I started working with back when we were on Zoom. Um, and she sought me to know and encouraged me uh, to try different things in photography. Most importantly, she encouraged me to apply for the school grant, uh, which funded this project. So without that, um, this project would not be possible. Um, thank you to my other advisor, Siobhan Addy, who unfortunately is not here today, um, but he helped me find my words and conceptualize my ideas and helped uh, inspire my work in a new way. Um, thank you, Christine Pishola and Pam Manji, for helping me with the technology and printing, um, scheduling and planning my trip to New Mexico. Thank you to all my classmates and friends who came out on this beautiful Friday afternoon to come uh, for this amazing exhibition. And thank you so much for the entire AAB department and the way for making this possible.
dropping in. But I noticed your your piece might come and go, and so to just pop in and, and to have you be speaking about your experience really adds a whole other level to um, just what I experienced when I just walked by and noticed it, and then to see you and hear your story, it's very impactful. Uh, I don't know if you're selling any of your pieces and where I can learn more about that. Um, I'm not currently selling any of my pieces, um, but thank you so much for your kind words. Um, all of my work is on my Instagram page um, and my Facebook, but yeah, thank you. Any other questions? So that's a place that I've never been to, and I'm very excited to go. I'll be taking many, many pictures while I'm there. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm gonna do what I do best, which is riff, um, since I don't have any notes with me. Um, uh, you guys all know me at like many different things. Um, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm a student filmmaker, I'm an artist for my housemates, I'm kind of their mom. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and a lot of you guys know me as Min because that's how I introduce myself. Um, but the correct way to say my name and the Vietnamese way to say my name is actually a name. Um, so you pronounce the H as a G, which is kind of weird. So that's why I never introduce it that, that way. Um, so if you strip all of those things away, I think that the most important thing about myself and the thing that I would like you guys to remember me by is that I'm Vietnamese because that is very important to me. Um, it underpins my identity and who I am not only as an artist, but also as a person. Um, so basically, this um, show right here is part one of my honor thesis, and it's inspired by my trip back to Vietnam during the pandemic. I actually spent 12 months um, back where I was born um, and crafted these two parts for the show. Um, so the first part, um, I titled Gok Gak, which is I guess only four people know what that actually means. Um, is a Vietnamese adjective used to describe a pair of objects um, that are mismatched. So they are lopsided, they're uneven, and the most important thing about them is that they meant to match, but they don't. It's like a pair of chopsticks where you bought one and then one of the chopsticks is a little longer than the other. Um, so that's where my inspiration came from um, and that's how I've learned to recall memories all of these years because um, when I first moved here to the United States, um, I would go back to Vietnam a lot and now thinking back about it, um, I can't like pinpoint when something happened because I was in between two different time zones and two different spaces, um, which feels like at the same time. So some memories are crisp, some memories are like blurry, and I can't pinpoint them. 
um, exactly when, when, or where, which thing happens. So they're kapkak in nature. Um, so during this trip back to Vietnam uh, was when I could see the idea for these two pieces up here. Um, I would love for you guys to come and take a closer look at it so you can see the details um, later. And I titled this, The Thing About Luck. Um, on my trip back to Vietnam, I encountered something that I grew up with but never paid attention to, um, which is Cheng Dong Ho, which is an Asian Vietnamese art form. Um, it originated in Dong Ho village, which is like north of where I was born. Um, and basically it was woodblock printed on via paper, which is like a Vietnamese special paper. Um, and like Dong Ho paintings uh, was set to originate it in the 11th century. But just like as any other like folk art, it's really hard to date back when exactly they came from. Um, so basically, the whole painting is considered a fine reflection of Vietnamese aesthetic values, social commentaries, um, as well as like philosophies. Um, as you can see here, two of the most famous noble paintings are Nam Gui Chuot, which is Winning of the Rats. No one asked me why. Um, and then, um, that look of Zoom, which means um, yin and yang pigs. And as you can see, like you can start to see like a lot of the culture and a lot of the traditional values reflected in them. Um, so the two that actually stood out to me the most are this pair of the whole paintings called Bing Hoa and Fu Gui. Bing Hoa is a Vietnamese word for glory, honor, and Fu Gui is for wealth as well as like, affluence. Um, so I came across these on my trip back and like I, something about them just fascinated me. Um, so I wanted to find a way to recreate them, give them new meaning, and like reinterpret them for the 21st century. So actually, at the same time that I discovered them, um, I thought about um, this Vietnamese culture called Sin Chu, which is a really weird thing to say because in, in English it would mean word seeking. But basically, like at the beginning of the year, you would come to um, a master calligrapher and ask for a word that you want to manifest. So let's just say this year I want to be rich, then I would like go ask for that. This or this year I want to be beautiful, then I was ask for the word beautiful. Things kind of things like that. So I was really inspired by the gestural nature of all of the letters and like the way that the ink are applied to the paper. Um, and that's when I started zooming in on the two folk paintings. As you can see, like on the corners here, you can start seeing the letters for Bing Hoa and Fu Gui, which I reinterpreted using screen printing on Somerset paper. Um, and these are made by me hand-painted emulsions onto screens before I exposed them and then printed them. Um, so it's kind of like a a minimal and abstract take on the painting themselves, but I kind of, as you can see here, is the second example. But then I sort of wanted to take um, it a step further and reference back to the painting even more. And actually, um, a few, and I, as you guys can see, like all of my works are like um, sort of um, came from like my collective memories. I would like pick one thing from one from one instant and another thing from another instant and then brought it all together. Actually, a few months ago, I went to MoMA with some of my friends um, and I was looking at this painting called The Juggler um, or The Magician by uh, Remedy Osvero, a Spanish surrealist. Um, and I really loved this painting, so I, I said, I want to take a picture of it. So what I did was I hold my phone up to the painting and my phone did this thing where it recognizes all of the faces in the painting. So I was like, I'm really inspired by that, so let me do something with it. So basically, I took these two paintings right here and sort of map out all the sections where you would consider the painting lucky. So as you can see on the left here, you have um, um, the rooster and um, basically this flower called Prestepimum. And basically, they both represent sort of wanting um, wealth, wanting affluence. And actually, in Vietnamese culture, since it's like a very like agriculture-based um, country, um, you would want like as many children as possible, which is like 
I can't relate, but um, <laughs> but it's like yeah, the chrysanthemum would represent um, fertility as well. And like, and on the right you have the duck, and then um, what is that flower? Um, what's the name? Yes, the lotus. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word. Uh, the lotus, uh, which in Vietnamese culture represents purity. Um, there is a saying called. Which means that lotus grows in mud, but they don't at all smell like mud. So they represent purity and all of the different things that are considered lucky in Vietnamese culture. So I started mapping out these things, and when you sort of take the painting away, they became these abstract, minimalist take on the painting themselves. So what I did was I engraved these lines onto plexiglass and then frame the initial screen print um, with it. So it's like my own rendition of the traditional painting themselves. Um, and then we move on to these two pieces next to them. And if, if you can see, you start seeing the two children again. Uh, and, I, and I was like, I was thinking about it, and I was like, what if you take away all of these elements that are lucky? What do you, what are you left with? So on my trip back to Vietnam, I was lucky enough to get on a government assigned flight, which was at the time really rare because Vietnamese was closing its, uh, Vietnam was like closing its borders. So like I was lucky enough to get on the flight, but then I had to quarantine in a quarantine camp uh, for 14 days um, in like um, a mil military camp basically. It was so hot. You don't have the internet. You have to queue to take a shower. It was obviously like a big, big experience. Uh, so I kept a journal of 14 days in a quarantine camp, and I consider this experience to be lucky because I was lucky enough to be able to get on the flight and go back to where I was born and spend like an amazing 12 months when everybody here was, you know, in their house doing practically nothing. So basically, I chose like um, entries from my diary. Um, and sort of put them where the rooster is, or the duck is, or uh, the lotus is. Um, and, and during this quarantine camp, we didn't have the internet, so we had to like entertain ourselves. So right outside of my room, there's this radio that would play the same five songs over and over and over and over again. I, and these songs were like Vietnamese pop songs from like the 90s and like early 2000s that like any Vietnamese would know, I'm telling you. Um, so like, um, I injected a, a few of the lyrics in there as well, because after like 14 days, I memorized my word, even though I didn't even like them that much. I like them now, they're kind of cheesy and fun. So um, as you can see, I just tried to strip away all of the other elements and just left the children. Um, and these were screen printed on uh, Awagami factory bamboo paper. Um, and then the typography was done here. Um, and the inspiration for the placement of the typography um, came from me wanting to break the rules for typesetting. Because like in graphic design class, you learn that type is used as something to convey information. So they are supposed to be legible, they're supposed to be logical, but I was like, what if I don't care about any of those things? And I just sort of place things where I think makes sense and like use really weird kerning as well as like using the tap for no reason just because I wanted to and it looks nice. So, and actually the placement of this um, reminds me of that millisecond when like the last droplet of water drops from like the, the rice um, after you're rinsing them. So that was really something really important to me because I do that every day. When we make that puzzle, we cook rice every day. So um, being able to freeze time in this one moment when like that last droplet drops from the, from the rice pillars themselves is such a special moment in my everyday life that I want to encapsulate that um, within the type setting for this piece. Um, and the last piece um, on the all the way to the right, right there, is called floor plan. Um, when I titled this, I didn't mean it to be like an architectural floor plan, but it's more um, the floor plan of my memory, which is sometimes really blurry and sometimes really sharp. So we have different sort of sections representing that. 
Um, the one that you guys are looking at on the screen are digitalized versions, so they don't have the same sort of textures that I hope to convey in the real piece, but I would love everyone to come up close and see, so that you guys can see all of the details. Um, basically, these pieces were inspired by KTT housing, um, which is um, these like um, apartment building blocks in Hanoi where I uh, was born and grew up. And then basically they were built during the communist period, mostly like in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s um, as a model of socialist housing. So basically like a lot of the family members would live together within these blocks or like a company and all of their employees would like live in another block. So basically like you share lives together. Like growing up, I remember because like right across from my house and right across from my grandparents' house, we would have these like KTT block housing. And I remember seeing like they would, in Vietnam, we hang our clothes to dry. So basically I would see these rocks. I would go from one building to the other where people would like hang clothes and you won't be able to tell which family owns which sections of clothes. So basically you share your life together and that was really important for me to convey. So basically I um, did these um, blocks from memory of the two KTC housing blocks I grew up with um, and then sort of emboss it onto um, paper. Um, if you guys like, look up close, you'll be able to see that. Um, and for these piece, I wanted to do sort of really analog techniques and techniques that are no longer in fashion. So basically, the middle, I would, can, I, can I come instead of staring at the screen for no reason? Um, so basically, these blocks right here were done um, with pochoir, which is a French technique for stenciling um, in printmaking. And basically, you have to be very intentional about your, your ink placement and your sort of movement in order to get the, the desired effect that you want. So for this, I want it to be blurry, so I apply most inks on the sides and like least ink in the middle. And then, the, so that was the first run for the print. The second run is um, chinkole which is a really bad translation for Chinese paper in the French language because chinkole is actually not using Chinese paper. It's traditionally used with Yankee paper, which is a really thin Brazilian Japanese paper. But for this project, I want to modernize it. I want to use something that is, that is a little bit sturdy and that I can do like embossing on top of it. So I use Asian color plan, which is a specialty craft paper. Um, so that's the second run of the print, and then the last one is um, the embossing. Um, uh, and I, I want to thank you to um, Erica for assisting me in running these prints because they took like a lot of time. And like in order to get these two, I think I made a total of 23, and 22 of them are now in the trash, hopefully recycled. Um, um, so it's a very finicky process, but I was really happy with the with the um, end products. I would love for you guys to come up close um, and look at the details. Um, so, so that is all of my pieces in meaning. And this um, exhibition represents a lot for me, but mostly it represents um, me and who I am today, which is a Vietnamese living in the United States. That is really, really important for me. Um, and to be able to all of to convey sort of different elements that I saw growing up and do it in a way that is um, modern and, do, and, and to use like all of the techniques that I've learned here at school was really important to me. Um, so yeah, so I would like to thank everyone for obviously coming. Um, I would like to thank um, the team from LUAC who helped me install this. Um, as you guys know, everyone installed two weeks ago, I installed yesterday. Um, and like, <laughs> so thank you for being patient with me and uh, help me make this happen. Um, and I would like to thank Professor Travers, Jason. Um, <laughs> we, we went all oh, way back, way back. But I would like to tell a little story just so you guys know my relationship with Jason. Um, I, I took my first drawing class when I was six. I quit after one session because I thought my chicken scratches were better than what the instructor was telling me to do. <laughs> so like, all my life I've done things my way and sometimes that's difficult and sometimes hard. 
Um, and coming here to Lehigh, obviously, with like a lot of pressure, um, Jason is someone who's all, always given me the freedom to do what I want. I remember in my first class with him, which is five years ago, um, in the famous, everyone here would know, the color Simon. Um, I was doing like a combination that I thought was really cool. He walked over and he said, are you sure? And I said, well, I am and you will be too. Uh, so, so thank you so much, Jason, for all these years for supporting me and letting me do what I want. Um, thank you so much. I'm grateful every day. Thank you, everyone. I feel really nice.
Hello.
emailed them. Um, and uh, they are like all of them are the So most of these are either no's or and furniture that I wanted to explore more. And I grew up on a mushroom farm in Kansas. And so with that, I was always working out with, uh, in the fields with my dad. And mushrooms need a very specific environment to grow. Um, and so I thought about how architecture should really be more designed for the things that are residing in it because both mushrooms and people need a roof over their heads, but the stuff that goes on inside of that is a lot more specific. So I think that architecture should turn more towards if people, we all know that people want to sit down and like eat somewhere or have a bed to sleep in, but with all these like just open floor plans that are unfurnished, like people are left like sleeping on the floor because they were able to afford the house, but then furniture is really an afterthought. So I really want this to be more combined um, so, with this, I'm looking at making complete living spaces, and what I consider a complete living space is something that has all the space is being utilized somehow, um, whether that's for storage, or even if it is for storage, something that's accessible to people, um, like for like the kitchen cabinets, we, I have to keep a chair, like a foldable chair, in this designated area, just to be able to reach half my kitchen, and I don't think that that is how we should keep approaching design where half the house is inaccessible. Um, 
and then also focusing on objects that support various human activities, which is part of the definition of furniture. Um, and again, a house should be more than a roof. It should be have all the stuff included for people to live comfortably. Um, so my work was really split into two parts. And this first part is looking at architecture as furniture, uh, approaching this question where how can we design houses of thinking of all the possible problems that we may need to solve for furniture or if people want to change something, having that be more easy. Um, because again, my father never was one to finish projects. So if he wanted to add an addition um, or tear down this wall, it would be like a curtain for a wall or steps to nowhere for years on end. And so that's something that I think a lot of people are in that situation for. So making that more accessible. So um, I looked at a lot of inspiration for how to approach this and what people are already doing, um, especially with Japanese architecture, focusing on that tiny houses for how to fully utilize space. So this one, uh, House NA, I really liked how there's a lot of different levels and how you can really separate spaces without making walls. I think a big thing of the open floor plans is getting rid of walls, but then um, still being able to identify spaces uh, without closing it off was very interesting. And then the other part of this that I really liked is how the split levels make it ambiguous to whether it's a step or somewhere to sit, kind of like the steps over by building C. And then looking more into that, um, this looks at spaces with the ceiling height for how tall a ceiling really needs to be. If like under there, the space is designated for you to be sitting, you don't need like all of this space, it could be used for something else. Um, and then even if you do have that space, having it be accessible. So having that little ladder area to go up above there. And then another area that I looked into utilizing was the subspace of underneath the house into like stilt houses of having that be something that can be activated to add more area for people to work with. And then a common thing that people are looking at too are having walls be for storage rather than just blank. Uh, I know that I'm always looking for more storage space, like my room is completely filled to the brim. And then this is another house that I think is very interesting where all of the juts in different levels uh, make it so that every part of it, you can do something in it. You can store something here, or you can sit there and do work, and it really activates all areas of the house. And so taking that inspiration, I looked into designing a compilation of space baby movements, and the example that I did was my own tiny house, but it's more so that people can pick apart like, oh, I really like that technique, um, that maybe we can look at doing for here. So the first thing I have is having it so that taller areas can be accessible. So this ladder uh, going on the whole wall being covered with shelves. Um, it's made so that it's like, kind of like those library rolling ladders and then it moves. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is a big thing I focused on, again, is having split levels to separate the areas of the house of, for this one, the kitchen and the living room. And then with the split level, it also makes it so that you can uh, sit, just a lady moves, sit going this way and like eat dinner or something. And then if you are done with that, then you can flip around and sit the way that she originally was and watch some TV. So it really makes the space um, more activated and flexible. And then that's also using the subspace for both having an area for feet as well as storage. And then it's also combining the use of a deck and parking structure for here, where this is the same size as a space that you could pull a small car, a small car into and have that be connected to the elements. 
And then the other thing I looked at was really, again, combining furniture and architecture, where uh, for this, the bed rolls away, and then the headboard is what the step is to get into the bathroom. Um, so I really don't, like, there's a lot of beds that, like, fold down into the area, um, but I think that this really utilizes the split levels of using that area underneath. Um, and so if you're living alone in this house you, and your bed's put away and it's a living room, you could step up into the bathroom, but then if it's rolled away, you can have the area be all your bedroom and still step up into the bathroom. And showing the space here, the area here is the same area as the queen size bed under here, so it pretty much rolls out perfectly. Um, and then with this, the possibilities are, I think that's very important to still have a full size kitchen and that's something I didn't want to budge on. So we still have 165 square feet with a full kitchen with this being the area to sit and eat or turn around and use as your living room. Um, with wall storage space, as well as this sub-level being continued underneath to put shoes. Um, and then the dimensions of the cabinets fitting for hanging shirts or the uh, full-size dresses, as well as looking into the dimensions of storage boxes. Um, and then I also, again, took inspiration from using more above storage space as seen here above the bathroom which is across here. So this ladder for the wall is, you can move it and flip it, and then be able to access the space above there. So really trying to cram a lot of stuff into a small area to have it be something that I think would be comfortable to live in. And then moving into the second part of my project is, it's really hard to incorporate all these things uh, starting from the designs and building it new. So. <laughs> Looking into more um, the growth of architecture is implementing furniture pieces that also interact with the architecture. Um, so I looked a lot into furniture pieces that are mobile and can be uh, either safe spacing, safe space saving, or it can convert into something else so you don't need two pieces. Um, so there's chairs that fold or break apart into smaller pieces. Um, this piece, which, piece which I'll come back to, has been a really big part of my inspiration of having a chair that can be like an extra chair, but is normally can just be a side table, mainly looking into like living room settings and have a lot of people over, instead of having to pull out a crappy folding chair that can be your side table. Um, other ways of breaking up space, going back to my father of wanting to constantly change the house, um, that can be done with a moving wall. Um, or another way to flip the space instead of having it be through sitting. Is it, uh, this is a wall that can flip and have a mirror and TV on either side to change what that space is being focused on using for. Um, and then also going back to using the overhead space, um, using that for storage. And then other convertible items of making things either more accessible or able to store away for more space. Looking at the beds, um, the shelves that go down to a table, and then this is a couch that folds up into uh, two twin beds, bunk beds, and then uh, for kitchen cabinets, it can be pulled down so that you can fully access all of your kitchen. And then stairs, having them be more mobile so that stairs aren't taking up as much space in your home as they really do most of the time. And so with that, I've been approaching a few designs and I've been really thinking about what I would need in my house and something that I think a lot of other people would appreciate. So I have a lot of shoes like a lot of shoes, like sometimes I bought like nine pairs of shoes in one go just because I like them and I need somewhere to store them and I keep adding to this shoe rack outside my house or just stacking more layers on top of each other 
but really, again, integrating architecture and furniture. I thought that you could just replace your entire like coat closet door with shoe storage so that you would have these slats that can fold down and then you can put your shoe on top of there um, so that it's right there and it's not like an extra shelf taking up space, but it's incorporated into the architecture. Um, and I'm also taking account of boots because then you could have longer rods that also act as the pieces that you normally stick into boots to keep them straight. Um, so that's something that's at least helpful to me. And then really looking into what doors can do to be activated into architecture. Um, solving the problem of kitchen cabinets being up too high and the problem of me having my special designated kitchen chair to reach, up, reach cabinets is either having a stool that replaces your cabinet door that kind of pops out as part of the door um, so it has a designated spot in your house um, or the easier part of having it installed on the inside so that it's easily accessible and something that actually fits into the house. And then the final one that I'm actually looking into building right now is, again, taking a lot of inspiration from that initial table that flips up, but a big problem I saw with that was that that creates a 90 degree angle for sitting, and nobody likes that. So with this, I have it so that I have two leg arms um, with a large space, so that looking right here, you can have an angled mortise and tenon, so that um, this is pretty much a side table with two shelves and then the top one. And then this has a back at that angle that's pretty much already at the seating angle. So then all you need to do is flip that up to change how it's being used in the space. Um, and that's what I'm currently working on right now to be done by the end of the year. And this is this. Thank you. chair as more of a sculpture or more of a, um, a furniture piece that's more for like utility? I really want it to be utilized, um, which is also why I wanted to add plenty of shelves for it to be used as storage, um, but still be an option to go to for again, like having that extra chair there. But yes, I really want it to be something useful. Well, I think your designs are wonderful. I can imagine how functional they would be. Just imagine college life and dorm life, like how uh, useful all of that will be. So I'm excited to see where your research goes and your design creation. Thank you so much, Mia. That's wonderful.